In a previous video, we walked through step-by-step step on how to set up six to four automatic tunnels for the purpose of getting across a portion of our network that was not IPv6 ready or capable. So that's all well and good, but what if we want to have more reachability than just the 2002 prefixes? For example, let's go to R2 and let's add a new loopback interface with this IP address right here. So we'll go to R2 and on R2, we'll go into configuration mode, create a new loopback interface and assign it an IP address within this network space of 2222 colon two. And we'll use a host ID of two as well. So now we have this brand new network. What's the problem? Well, the problem is all of our other six to four devices, all they have is a static route pointing to 2002 they don't have static routes going for 2222 or anything else. So how do we solve that? Well, one solution that we could implement is to use static routes, leveraging the six to four addresses that are already reachable. Check this out. If we tell, for example, R3, that to reach the 2222 network, to go ahead and use the next hop as the six to four IP address on R2 any 6 to 4 IP address that's within that space with the 202. By doing that, we can leverage the 6 to 4 tunnels. So let's go over to R3 and let's add a static route right here that says, Dear Mr. R3, to get to 2222 colon 2, your next hop is going to be 2002, 202, 202 colon 1 colon colon, and R2's last host ID is 2 for that subnet as well. And so by doing that, it's gonna use the static route to figure out how to reach the next hop. So it'll recurse that and figure that out. And we should have full reachability from R3 to this brand new subnet leveraging on top of the existing six to four tunnels. So let's go over to R3 and do that right now. So on R3, we'll simply go into configuration mode and we'll add a static route that says, Dear Mr. R3, to get to this network right here, of 2222 colon two, go ahead and use the next hop of 2002, 202, 202, one colon colon two, which is the reachable six to four address that's currently on R2. All right, so off we go to the races. So we simply put one static route in and that's it. Now we can verify that that works by simply doing a ping. So let's do that real quick and make sure we can ping the next hop and if we can ping the next hop, that means our six to four tunnels are working, and then we we'll go ahead and ping the final destination. So here's a ping to the six to four address. That works great. And just a quick peek, let's take a look at the static routes. We should have one for the six to four tunnels and one for the new 2222 subnet. So assuming they're both in place and we have reachability to the static, to the next hop, we should now be able to do a full ping to the 2222 network. So let's test that out with a ping to 2222 colon two colon colon two, which is the IP address that we assigned to that new loopback 1000 on R2. Hooray, congratulations, it works. And that's how we can leverage our existing six to four tunnels and the reachability we have through those by using the next hop, which is on the far side of the network that will be reachable for additional networks as we just did with the 2222 network. Now, let's talk about reality for a second. How fun is it to manage static routes? For example, new networks pop up. In this case, we'd have to add static routes on not only R3, but R4, R5, R7, R6. And that can be quite tedious and painful to manage, especially if we didn't do any kind of summarization beforehand on which networks we're going to be hiding behind which routers. So the next possibility that comes to my mind is, well, if we're not going to use static routing because it's a pain to manage, why don't we do dynamic routing with a routing protocol? And here's the catch with six to four tunnels. We don't have a common network between R2 and R6. I mean, routing protocols, IGPs like OSPF, RIP, and EIGRP, all the IP, IPv6 flavors, they need to be on the same common subnet as their neighbor so they can form an adjacency. They're also going to use link local addresses as the next hop. And for those reasons alone, R6 and R2 are never going to become neighbors across the automatic six to four tunnels, at least not with IGPs, interior gateway routing protocols. So what can we do? We can get a little bit creative and we can use BGP. 
See, BGP, the neighbors, don't have to be directly connected. As long as there's a TCP connectivity between them, and then we can tell R2, hey, be a neighbor with R3, be a neighbor with R4, and set yourself, meaning your IPv6 six to four tunnel address, go ahead and have that network address space, one of your interfaces, be the peer in that BGP session. So that when R2 advertises these routes to R3, R3 will see the next hop is 2002, 202, 202, et cetera, and be able to reach it. So as a test, let's go ahead, while we're right here on R3, and let's remove the static route that we just created and then replace it with BGP. Not only will this be a good practice for working with dynamic routing protocols, it'll also be a good refresher on some of the basic concepts of BGP. And I want to show you a couple of new things that you probably weren't familiar with. Okay, so the static route is now gone. One of the things we're going to do is if we want this network right here, 2222 to be advertised, we need to tell R2 to share it. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump back over to R2, set up BGP to advertise that network, and then we'll come back to R3 and we'll tell R3 to be the neighbor itself. So back we jump over to R2 and on R2 we'll exit out of interface configuration mode and we're going to run router BGP. Now I'm going to use external BGP because that way the next hop will always be my BGP interface that I'm using. Also, when I specify the actual peer that I'm going to work with, I'm going to specify IPv6 addresses locally and the remote ones because that's what I want for my next hop. Also, by default, IP BGP is going to be supporting native IPv4. We're not using IPv4, so we can go ahead and disable that functionality. It's not going to bias anything if we leave it on. And then I'm simply specifying the neighbor. So R2's neighbor is the IPv the 6 to 4 tunnel address that R3 is using, and he's in remote AS3 or will be. The eBGP multi-hop is because external BGP has an issue if the TTL is greater than one, so that fixes that. And I'm also specifying the update source of loopback 6, which is R2's interface that's connected to the 202, the 2002 network because that's the IP address I want to use as the next hop as I advertise routes over to R3. So that part's done, but it's not complete. There's still just a little bit more we need to do. If we want to share that network, the IPv6 network, we have to do two things. The first thing is we have to turn on the feature with multi-protocol BGP, which is really what we're doing, that says, I want to be able to send and receive IPv6 routes with my peers. And to do that, we go into a special compartment into BGP, and that's called an address family. And there's lots of different address families with multi-protocol BGP. But we're going to go into the address family for IPv6. So think of it as going into the logical compartment where we work with and tweak the IPv6 parameters. And the first thing we're going to say is, I want to actively participate and share IPv6 routes with my good buddy. And you put the peers IP address and say the keyword activate. I'm also going to say no synchronization because I don't want to have to have the IPv6 routes in my IGP, because I'm not running one for IPv6, before BGP will accept them and put them in my routing table. So the last piece of this, now that we have the neighbor statements in place, we en enabled IPv6 sharing, the last thing we need to do is tell R2 to go ahead and share the network. So let's go ahead and do that right now. And R2 will simply say, I want to add the network and make sure I get the correct network here. We're trying to add the 2222 colon two network address space. So that network, assuming I didn't do a typo in my when I created the loopback interface, if we say network 2222 colon two colon colon slash 64, hopefully that'll make it into BGP. Now what I always like to do is verify that the router where I'm bringing in that route, make sure it's really in the BGP table. Because if it's not in the BGP table locally, it's really not going to be shared with anybody else. So a quick show IP BGP all, the all keyword will show it for all address families, will show us whether or not it made it. And check it out. We have this route inside of our BGP table. Perfect. What's left to do? Well, what's left to do is go over to router 3 and say, dear Mr. Router 3, let's configure you for pretty much the same exact process. So we'll go over to router 3. 
and we're going to say router BGP, and we're going to use external BGP. So I'm going to say autonomous system number three, and I'm going to turn off the, the IPv4 support because we're not using it. And then we're going to specify three neighbor statements. One neighbor says, one neighbor statement is going to say, my neighbor is in remote AS2. The next neighbor statement is going to say, we're using eBGB multi-hop, which is it's okay if the TTL is greater than one because we're sourcing from loopbacks and literally we're not directly connected. And then we're also going to specify the update source. And that's because I want to source my end of the BGP session from the 6 to 4 2002 address space that we need for the next tops in case I want to share routes with them. Now, just for fun, let's enable debug for IPv6 routing. Why? Because then we can see the exact moment that that route, assuming the BGP neighborship works between R2 and R3, we'll see the exact moment that it comes up. So we'll enable debug for IPv6, and then we'll go in to the address family for IPv6 and activate our peer, which is basically saying, I'm willing and ready and able to share and receive IPv6 routes with this good buddy at 2002.202.202.1 colon colon two. Also turn off synchronization here. Now, if we just look at the console here for a moment, I'm gonna leave this in real time. As soon as our neighborship comes up, moments after that, we should get that route inside of our routing table. So I'm gonna just uh, let it run. I don't want the, shouldn't take that long for the neighborship to come up. There's our neighborship right there. So that already came up. We should have the route here in just a few moments. Do, 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 Jeopardy music, for those of you who realize I'm tone deaf. And let's see, there it is. Okay, so there's the route. Literally, we added that route to the routing table. And to verify, we know it's in BGP because it came into the routing table as well. But let's go ahead and do a full test. Let's just do a show and verify that the BGP route is there. It is. Let's verify the routing table for IPv6 with the show IPv6 route. And it's there. And finally, we can go ahead and simply verify that we can ping that destination, which we can. Now, when we're done with this, we could add network statements on R2 and R3, and those would dynamically propagate and be added to each other. So if we had R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, and R7, and R9, here's the bad news. If we really wanted to do dynamic routing, this, my friends, is a lot of work for dynamic routing. It probably, if we're gonna do this and do a full mesh of BGP peers, it probably would be easier to do straight up static tunnels between R2 and R3 and just run an IGP across that tunnel and be done with it. But the request came in, can we do dynamic routing over IPv6, six to four automatic tunnels? The answer is yes. And we'd use BGP to accomplish it. Hey, thanks everybody for watching. Have a great day. And one more quick update. I just did a full transcript of this step-by-step -step up on our blog site. I'll put the link right here. If you want to go check it out, please feel free to. And again, thanks for listening.